Asian and Euro-Americans, cross-cultural episodic memory for efficient teaching. It is widely known that culture is a salient feature that shapes the way we think, the way we speak, and the way we act. Thus, language and thoughts are closely related as long as the language we speak constrains our thoughts. Recent studies on the growing field of cultural neuroscience have found that people from collectivist cultures, Asians for instance, think of themselves as connected to other people in their lives, while Westerns adhere to a strong sense of individuality. A very interesting and important fact to understand the way brain develops in different parts of the world. The content of this video is framed within culture mapping, a research strategy that involves mapping cognitive or neural differences across cultures and will focus on how Euro-Americans and Asians carry out the process of encoding episodic memories. As culture mapping can demonstrate how the same environment or input is processed differently by individuals from different cultures, we will show the most salient aspects displayed by 10 participants while recalling a specific event in their lives. We will ask 5 Westerns and 5 Asians to recall their most memorable birthday party in order to briefly map their perceptual and encoding processes. Through this analysis, we aim to experience and get closer to general and valuable insights that previous studies have provided in cultural neuroscience and episodic memory. Before going straight to the experiment, let's back it up with some theoretical considerations on cultural neuroscience and English learning. Cognitive and neural differences. The human brain accumulates cultural experience since very early moments in a person's life. Its effects are long-lasting and shape our thoughts and behavior, which tends to change and evolve across lifespan within different cultural frames. As a result, Neural connectivity is modified through sustained engagement in cultural practices. Thus, it is possible to say that culture is embrained. And from Costa 2015, we know that human evolution became dependent on culture more than nature. Coevolution of culture and brain arises from a narrow link between cultural and neural processes. And it has been recognized that this is possible because of brain plasticity. This is to say that cultural practices adapt to neural constraints and the brain adapts to cultural practice. Evidently, this plasticity allows human beings to get adapted to different cultures and cross-cultural experiences. Taos University psychologist Nalini Amberi, PhD, one of the field's pioneers has found that even as people perceive the same stimulus, their brains may activate differently. Regarding our work from Mbari and Barusha 2009, we know that Asians and Americans activate different areas of the brain while performing, for instance, numerical and non-numerical tasks. It was shown that Americans activated Wernicke's and Broca's areas, which are associated with language processing. Meanwhile, Asians showed more activation in a visual premotor association area, which is associated with visual spatial processing. Encoding of episodic memory. So, what is episodic memory? It is referred to as cerebral processing that deals with time, places, participants, and associated emotions that build our personal or biographical inventory of memories. Remembering the last vacation, the first day of a new job, a turbulent airplane trip, 
or pairing our first cat is part of retrieving episodic memory. All together with semantic memory, it builds the explicit memory we know as declarative memory, one of the types of long-term human memory. As a matter of fact, semantic memory can bring out information about what a cat is. Meanwhile, episodic memory will recall information on how we felt patting, feeding, or playing with the animal. As a result, there we will be building a long-term memory on a special pet we had. At this point, we can establish a clear difference between knowing and remembering. Right, Lucy, these are your brain scans here. I'm afraid they show no improvement. The temporal lobe was severely damaged in the accident. But what we believe is that scar tissue here is impairing your ability to convert short-term memory into long-term memory while you sleep. The condition has come to be known as Goldfield syndrome. Uh, who's Goldfield? A brilliant Lithuanian psychiatrist. Uh, he himself suffered temporal lobe damage. It took him four years to publish his findings because he had to keep starting over from scratch. <laughs> Obviously, your sense of humor is still intact, and that's, that's here. Magnificent amygdala. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce to you our most distinguished clinical subject, Tom. Uh, hi, I'm Tom. Henry. Marlon. Doug. Lucy. Hi. Oh, those are cool flip-flops. In the movie 50 First Dates, we can find a patient who is unable to remember more for more than 10 seconds. This person has access to the semantic memory as she interacts fluently with people, but her episodic memory cannot be accessed at all. From Isingrini and Taconat, we know that the episodic memory role deals with information acquisition during a particular event and its reproduction during an anterior event. From an anatomical point of view, these authors report previous seminal studies about cerebral occurrence of episodic memory, which includes internal parts of temporal lobe, hippocampus, and mammillary body, but also it is stated that recent studies display a narrow link between episodic memory and frontal cortex. Influence of culture on episodic specificity. Episodic specificity can be defined as the retrieval of specific details about past events that characterized episodic memory representations. As an indicator of whether and in how much detail episodic memory is produced, Specificity can be assessed in multiple ways to measure its accuracy, how it gets influenced by inherent or external factors. This work will draw on four categories from cultural neuroscience theories to map out the differences between cultures while encoding episodic memories. The memories of our participants will be categorized in semantic and episodic memory to establish a conceptual difference. Furthermore, intrapersonal and interpersonal processes on episodic memory will be explained by means of our participants' recalls. At the beginning of the video, we stated the difference between semantic and episodic memory. Together, they build episodic specificity. Let's see how accurate our participants are at achieving this specificity as they tell us about their most memorable birthday party by using semantic and episodic memories. Now, let's listen to our Western participants. Their reminiscences deal with details about the presents they were given, how special were these gifts for them, details about the temperature and moments during the day, people that they met, or in like our Cuban participant, people who were absent during the birthday, which reports episodic recall. So when I turned six years old, my parents bought me an HO scale train set an electronic train. Mm -hmm. So when I saw this train, all I had was the track and the train that my parents gave me. But I was very intrigued and fascinated because it was the first time I had an electric train. 
I thought that would be the best gift ever. But the great thing about a model train is that one is never finished if you have enough space. So later, my parents threw a big uh, surprise party for me, and I got to have the foods of my choice. Also, my cousin showed up, so we played basketball for hours, various sports, also wolfball. ball. Well, to my surprise, as satisfied as I was with the electrical train, my aunt and uncles came with other presents to add to the train. Toy cars, even electrical lit up buildings that you could plug in that go along with the train. For my birthday, I went to work as normal. I work in an art gallery in a suburb called Carlton. But that day, it was a very hot day in Melbourne. It would have been in the high 30s, maybe 38 degrees. Not many people came into the gallery, so it was quite a, a nice, quiet day. I didn't tell the lady that I work for that it was my birthday, so it was a very nice, quiet day. But my family sent me lots of messages by WhatsApp, which is how we generally speak to each other when we're at work. But years went by and I took a job in West Palm Beach, and that's in Florida, and my family was in New Jersey. And it turned out that that year, I was turning 60. I'm 62 now. Mm -hmm. So it's memorable, I still remember it. Mm -hmm. I was by myself in an apartment in West Palm Beach. My future wife, Nora, was north. There was nobody around. Mm -hmm. But there was one family there that I knew and that were friends of mine. Mm -hmm. I had no idea that she knew about my birthday. She invited me over just to say, hey, come over have a beer, and that's it. Mm -hmm. I didn't even mention my birthday. But when I went over there, they had cake, which I don't eat. <laughs> they had uh, all sorts of food that they made, and she made the food that I liked the most. Okay. And uh, she made sure that the food did not have any meat. At the time, I wasn't having meat, and I still don't eat meat. Let's see how our Western participants back up their episodic reminiscences by means of semantic memory which means that they will describe general truths, concepts or facts not specific to the event, such as names and types of places, like in our American and Australian participants, or social norms, like in our American male participant. I am here to talk about one of my most memorable birthdays. Um, we went to my favorite restaurant. It is called The Big Biscuit, and I got my favorite meal there, too, so that was good. Um, still was feeling kind of hungover and rough, though, so a little tired. Excited my friends were there, but just a little tired. And um, after that, we came back to the house, kind of got ready, and then we went to one of the biggest breweries in town called Boulevard. It's a pretty good one. I've been on a tour there a few times now, and um, they give you free samples at the end, which is cool. But the tour guides are also really knowledgeable, and they're really good at telling information about how it was formed and all of that, and they make jokes during the process. That ended up being a lot of fun. It was nice to get to share that experience with my friends because they hadn't been there before, and they had some new things that were different from the last time that I was there, so that was cool. Because for us, growing up in the U.S., you can't drink till you're 21. So my, when I turned 21, my dad said, here, you're a man now. Drink your first beer. And I loved it. It was the best moment of my life. It was my dad recognized me as an adult. You're an adult now. So it was a big realization. And more than anything, I was excited. For my birthday, I went to work as normal. I work in an art gallery in a suburb called Carlton. The gallery sells Australian art mostly, though we do sell some art from Europe and Russia. As Dr. Wong suggested in her 2009 study, in this section we will notice that Asians exhibit less episodic memory than Western people. Their reminiscences will be described shortly and will be related with loved ones like in the ladies from China and Philippines. At 
home, we also had a family gathering for my birthday. It was simple, but it was special for me because everybody was there. My uncles and my aunties and cousins came over and brought lots of food to celebrate uh, my birthday. My mom and my siblings were also there. That was unusual for me be, uh, because I grew up with my grandparents and we lived very far from my mom and my siblings. So everybody was there, everybody was happy. Mm, afternoon, I went to, the, went to the supermarket to buy so many food. I want to cook Chinese food for myself. And uh, af after when I come back, I hear so many, so many, so many blessings with my from from my family, and my friends. I also received a red pocket from my parents by me. As we can remember from the previous section, semantic memory deals with facts and information not directly related with the event reminiscence. It is interesting to notice how the lady from China and the lady from Philippines will talk about their traditions while celebrating birthdays and the meaning of food. Hello, my birthday is Chinese calendar 1st October. Last year I spent the birthday alone. Mm, every year I spend the birthday with my parents, with my sister or with my classmates. This year I come here. At first I didn't make friends at once. Now I make so many friends here. Uh, I remember it's the Saturday I have no work. In the morning I cooked a noodle for myself. It is Chinese traditional uh, eat noodles in birthday. It indicates you will live long life. The most common or the typical food that we eat on birthdays or celebrations is pancit. Pancit is a traditional Filipino food. For us, it signifies long life. Basically, it's made of rice noodles with vegetable and chicken meat or sometimes pork meat. We also have the rice cake. We also have the maha blanca, which is like a pudding, and suman, which is like a rice cake, but a little bit different. We don't celebrate 15th birthday or the sweet 15, as you call it but we celebrate the debut birthday which is the 18th birthday for us girls and 21st birthday for the guys as seen episodes are often backed up with semantic or generic memory to achieve specificity dr one suggested that compared with western stations tend to exhibit less specificity which was confirmed by our participants the encoding, retention, and retrieval of episodic memories are determined by multiple cultural variables, which may affect information processing at an intrapersonal and at an interpersonal level. According to Wang, the intrapersonal level in Western deals with an individual self-construct in autonomy and independence. On the other hand, Asians construct an interrelated self within their network of relationships. Conversely, at an interpersonal level, Westerns and Asians give importance to their episodic past through the reminiscing style they have learned from their parents. In short, and in general terms, Western parents try to grow up their children aiming to consolidate their self-control and distinguish from others. Meanwhile, Asian parents aim to endorse their children with an interdependent self-view, which means a strong sense of belonging. In both cases, emotional knowledge, which is a knowledge structure obtained from situations eliciting happiness and joy or sadness and grief, reinforces episodic memory, which has been confirmed through empirical researches. The memory enables us to form an awareness of identity, personal as well as collective. Although the personal memory may be considered a product of the mind or brain, 
Research in the past decades has revealed an important role of culture in human cognition and remembering. This study brings up an important aspect to consider when teaching. Be aware of your students' cultural background. Get to know what psychological and behavioral tendencies are associated with the brain function when planning the topic you are introducing to your class. When teaching a foreign second language, consider that language goes beyond merely structures and lexicon. We are immersing our students into a new culture too. Ensuring the use of materials that are culturally appropriate is important. In the end, cultural neuroscience could be a mean for better understanding people from different cultures. Certainly, every culture deserves respect. That is why we will keep in mind the differences for our opinions and creed, but it is in our hands to make our students aware of the richness in culture. In the daily practice in the classroom, when selecting the resources, check the presence of activities where they reinforce the episodic memory. Through the use of alluring materials and related to the culture under study. By differencing this material and resources, we could reach to every individual in our classroom. Some teachers have kindly provided us with their personal testimonies of their teaching practice. Here we name a couple of activities where you build up episodic memory. Johnny Benalcázar, English teacher at Hector Sempertegui Garcia School, Cuenca. Battle of Sexes. You split the class into girls and boys. Ask them to go to the board and write sentences using a structure you have chosen. The winner is the group with more sentences after the time that is set previously. The strong sense of competition against the other sex and the challenge of the activity keeps all the students involved. Certainly, we drive out the way of common gender stereotypes. In both cases, the sense of competition is challenging for the human nature. Jorge Villavicencio, English instructor at Universidad Politécnica Salesiana, Cuenca. Grammar action. In a sheet of paper, you present 10 correct and incorrect sentences. It is suggested to use the sentences the students have problems with previously. At the very beginning, the students are given $1,000. Then they will decide if the sentences read aloud are correct or incorrect to bet certain amount of money. The group with more money will be the winner. The figurative handle of money may motivate the students to keep participating as they simulate a real action. Moreover, the students will recognize the sentences they were struggling in a class before. Brian Horseman, English instructor at Unai Azogues. Cadaver Exqui. Provide students with a pattern to be filled. Students are not aware of what the others have written. You hand a piece of paper to the first student who will write a sentence following that pattern. Each student writes a word on a sheet of paper, folds the paper to conceal it, and passes it on to the next player for his or her contribution. The unusual and surrealist final story make the activity memorable. Janina Quito, English instructor at the University of Cuenca. Play the teacher role. Ask students for a new explanation of the grammar point studied in their own words to the whole class. The event goes to the episodic memory as long as the student internalizes the experience of explaining a difficult structure to their classmates under a certain level of pressure. Sandra Chicaiza. English instructor at the University of Cuenca. Family tree. Pair work to introduce each other's family trees and habits. They choose a special event to recall and share to the class through an oral presentation of their family trees. Students easily remember the family members by recalling emotional episodes. To sum up, the current thesis shows us how episodic memory can be developed from emotional retrieval of memories. The more emotive the experience is, the more the episodic memories get fixed in the brain. <laughs>